The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Carbon Dating. And actually this video shouldn't be called Carbon Dating at all. Uh, and it, maybe it even shouldn't be called Radiometric Dating because I'm not going to be, I'm not a scientist, I'm not going to teach you everything you need to know about Radiometric Dating. Uh, I named it Carbon Dating because that's the version of Radiometric Dating that most people seem to be familiar with and it's also the one that you'll frequently hear from callers of the show objecting to dating methods when they conflict with their religious beliefs. There are tons of good websites out there and videos that will teach you in detail everything you need to know or everything you might want to know about radiometric dating and carbon dating. That's not what this is. Uh, I am going to talk about some of it secondarily. By all means, go watch the other content and review content from science organizations that will give it to you accurately and not just give you the, uh, the McNuggets that I'm about to uh, address. I wanted to raise this issue because, especially from creationists, I seem to get pushback uh, on science in a lot of different areas. But here's an area of science where the pushback just seems bizarre. And as what we're really talking about is measuring things in the world, it strikes me as weird that we don't get a lot of pushback on other methods of measuring. So I want to talk a little bit about radiometric dating, uh, but more about the reliability and how we, as non-believers, should address the topic, given that I'm not an expert, the people I'm talking to aren't experts, so where does that leave us? So first it's probably worthwhile to point out, again, that science doesn't make proclamations of truth. Science is not uh, in the business of saying, ah, this item is 573,000 years old, period. That's this the facts. It's not the way science works. It's not the way it works with dating or anything else. Science creates tentative, probabilistic models that best describe the universe. We take the avail available evidence and we construct a model that is the current best understanding of how best to explain that evidence. If it turns out to be the case that uh, the best explanation were to be a god, um, cool. We would need the level of data and diligence and, and understanding of error bars and everything else within that model as we would for any other. That never turns out to be the case, or at least hasn't been so far. But what, what creationists and religious individuals who are objecting to science are doing are engaging in a little bit of cherry picking, a little bit of, oh, this conflicts with what I already believe, so I'm going to challenge this point. If you were to measure things around your house, how would you do it? And I'm talking about the physical measurements. Would you grab a yardstick? Would you grab a ruler? How about a tape measure? Um, maybe you would, you know, go a little more old fashioned, do some rough relativistic guesses, maybe hold up a string, use that spring and go take it to a tape measure. But let's say I bought a ruler. Um, by default, I don't know how many science objectors have ever actually purchased a ruler from a craft store or an office supply store and then done any steps to verify that the ruler is actually 12 inches long. I've never done it. Um, that would seem bizarre. And yet we know that it's possible that you could get a ruler that was manufactured inaccurately or that has a printing error. You know, maybe somebody sized something improperly. And so what you're running around with a 12-inch ruler uh, may in fact be a 10.9-inch ruler. And if you're not, you know, really good at identifying distances, you might use it for a long time without realizing it. So by and large, we tend to trust that if we buy a ruler, we're getting a ruler, despite the fact that we know that might not be the case. So why is it we're much, much, much more stringent when it comes to questioning methods that we don't know and don't understand? I'd argue that in part it's because we don't understand them that we raise these questions. There's something mysterious um, uh, about science to some people. And it's, it's partly, I think, because we put this science label on a great many things. If instead we were just to talk about measurements, okay, I could buy a ruler, I could hold it up against another ruler, I could go find uh, some place that demonstrates, hey, here is the standard 12-inch measurement, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I could hold it up against a yardstick or other measuring devices, or 
I know that, for example, this table is 18 inches by 18 inches, and so I can use the ruler and mark and do it and see how accurate it is. Uh, there's lots of different ways to test it. If I know that the, the width of my hand, roughly, I can determine how accurate it is. And each of these are going to be more or less precise. They have different uh, accuracy levels, and yet we don't ever bother doing that. For A ruler is just a ruler. A yardstick's a yardstick. Uh, Matter of fact, I, now that I've said it, it makes me wonder if somebody's actually been manufacturing yardsticks, you know, slightly smaller than they're supposed to be on accident. Uh, it would be kind of kind of trolly, although nobody really uses a yardstick for anything other than stirring paint, I think, at this point, uh, or for craft projects and uh, school projects. But outside of measuring length, we also measure time. And I could measure time with a sundial, I could measure it with my wristwatch, I could go to the atomic clock or anything that's connected to the atomic clock to get the correct time and to verify that, you know, hey, is my, the clock in my house, is it running fast, is it running slow? And each of these measuring devices has a different degree of accuracy. My wristwatch actually syncs up to my phone and will update the time based on an atomic clock, but I have other wristwatches that don't. They run down, they run slow. Some of them run a little fast, some of them run a little slow. And how do I know that they're running fast or slow? By comparing them to other things. This is the process of data collection that allows us to determine whether or not a particular method is reliable, and more importantly, how reliable it is, how accurate it is, and how consistent it is with that accuracy. When you're putting together a puzzle, for example, pick a big 500,000 piece puzzle, whatever, uh, most of us have, that have done this have had an experience where you're, you're comparing pieces at very early on in the stage uh, of putting the puzzle together and you find two pieces that seem to fit but maybe not quite and so in your head you play this, this little game of, okay, it looks like these two are supposed to together, go together but maybe they weren't cut exactly right, maybe there was some kind of cutting error, you know, is there a little extra bit of cardboard there that's keeping it from going together? That happens more often early in the process of putting a puzzle together than it does later. Because later you have more pieces that fit, you have a better understanding of what the full image is going to be, you have a better understanding of what colors match up, you have found fewer and fewer cutting errors, so you are less likely to use that as, a, as an excuse for why two pieces don't go together. Also, instead of trying to put one piece with one, now you're matching one up with two, or one up with three, or in some cases one up with four. And this is kind of analogous to what science does. As we get more information, we get a better understanding of the picture. We have a better understanding of what will work and what won't work. We also know that for the pieces that are left, we know how likely they are to go in this area of the puzzle versus this area of the puzzle. These are all analogies specifically to address what we do with carbon dating or more specifically radiometric dating. When I say this has to do with radiometric dating, it's because that's an amazing process that covers a lot of different areas. It's not just carbon dating. Carbon dating, I believe, came out in the around 1960 or so. Um, and carbon dating it relates to the radioactive decay of carbon-14. So it's worthwhile to go out and learn about sedimentary layers, to learn about the carbon exchange uh, process that happens, uh, radioactive isotopes and radioactive decay, um, to learn where various methods apply and how, because there are a lot of radiometric dating methods. They don't all, they're not all useful in the same circumstances, uh, but there's enough of them that they overlap. And so you might have, for example, carbon running from the present to roughly 50,000 years ago, maybe 60 at the outside. Uh, and that's based on the half-life decay of carbon-14, which is like 5,700 years or so. You don't have to remember all the numbers. I might not even be completely accurate. I'm roughing it because that's not the point. The point is that if we're gonna date something and we are convinced that it falls within the range where we could get a date based on carbon dating. We have other methods that overlap. Some of it might go from 100 years ago to billions of years ago. Some of them might go from 100 years to hundreds of thousands of years or early millions of years. The interesting thing about this is that it serves a couple of roles. First of all, it lets us use several different dating methods to find the date for an object. And if they are consistent, if each of them is giving a different result, it's like using uh, a sundial, uh, a wristwatch, and the atomic clock to, to come up with the correct time. Because that overlap allows us to use different dating methods on the same object. But there's more than that. Each of these is going to have different accuracies. By and large, as a general rule, 
the wider the date range that a method can determine, the less accurate it's gonna be. So if you have a dating method that can determine an age from 100 years to 50 billion years, uh, okay, obviously that's not a good number to pick, but we'll go from 100 years to 13 billion years. It's likely that the accuracy for that is gonna be plus or minus millions of years. That the most we can say is, this is roughly 1.2 billion years old, plus or minus 400 million years. And so there's not a, a, an acute precision to that method, but it gives us a range. And as the, the date range decreases, of course, the accuracy is going to increase. So we can date with carbon dating, let's say this, this dates to uh, 2,000 years ago, plus or minus 65 years or something like that. Um, learning the reason behind this and the math and the science and, and all that is valuable. But merely understanding that we're never relying on a single date method, that we are not making proclamations about truth. Instead, we are saying, hey, we use this dating method or these dating methods, and we came to a date that is roughly this old, plus or minus this much. The plus or minus is an admission that we're not making some sort of, sort of proclamation of truth that is uh, dogmatic. It is based on a number of assumptions. Hang on, the creationist says. You're just admitted you have to make a number of assumptions uh, in order to get this to work. Yes, yes, I'm very sorry, but that's the way reality works. We make assumptions and we try to make them reasonable. We refine our assumptions based on the actual data, which is how we've learned that some dating methods, particularly ones using helium, don't necessarily give reliable dates. That, they're, that while they could be used as a dating method in some very specific scenarios, they're not accurate enough for us to be relying on regularly for other things. We assume that uh, when this layer of rock is laid down and then there's one on top of it that has the fossils and then one on top of that, um, that nobody came along and removed that middle layer, manipulated things in it, and then stuck that layer back in. That is a very, very, very safe assumption. Um, but yes, we can't absolutely prove that that didn't happen. And we have to know as much as we can about the sample. We have to make sure there wasn't tampering. Uh, and if one of the biggest problems is in using something like carbon dating that can only date to 50 to 60,000 years um, on items that are outside of that range because the, the mistaken assumption that it, that it should be dated with carbon dating is what's going to throw off the results. But the important thing is, yes, there are anomalies. Yes, there are going to be uh, mistakes made, especially when you've got humans doing this. Uh, and yet, we know of no more reliable method than to use multiple methods to try to date a sample and honestly report how accurate we think that measurement is. Now, in much the same way that I've never checked any of my rulers to make sure that they were up to the international standard, we don't really hear a lot of objections from creationists uh, on other scientific methods that are perhaps even less reliable than radiometric dating, uh, that are more widely used or people are more familiar with. I mean, it took a while even for DNA testing to be publicly accepted and used in courtrooms. Um, and, and it's not perfect. Science and scientists are in particular, the science communicators, have held science almost in a place of reverence and mystery, which may be doing some harm. Because by giving some people the impression that science is a declaration of truth and that science is, oh, it's the awesomest, uh, which it is, but gives an impression that we're claiming perfection. And for creationists, finding an imperfection in something that claims to be perfection is all they need because that's what people have been doing to their God belief forever. Basically say, ah, you know, almighty God, can God create a burrito so hot that even he couldn't eat it and, and things like this. Or, you know, if your God's so uh, real and important and why doesn't he seem to care about suffering? Why can't God heal amputees? All of these things, they've dealt with these sorts of questions for ages. And when it's time to address the scary prospect of evolution, uh, the notion that we all have a common ancestor, that the processes are natural, that it's natural selection, selection acting on random mutations, the biggest factor is time. 
and this is why young Earth creationists in particular are vehemently opposed to radiometric dating methods. Because uh, first of all, even the carbon-14 dating uh, would date things that are older than the universe they think they live in, you know, the, the universe of six to 10,000 years. And so, of course, they're going to go after carbon dating. Why would they bother going after potassium argon or any of the other methods uh, that are dating things out to millions of years when any time they hear the phrase millions of years, they, should, they can just scoff? Ah, oh, when your teacher says millions of years, you should ask, were you there? That's something that you know, either Ken Ham or Kent Hovind or both uh, have been you know, popular for doing. Uh, and my favorite response to that has always been, well, then were you there when Jesus was crucified and rose? They, because what they're really objecting to at this point is how reliable can anything in the past be? Well, they raise those objections with respect to radiometric dating. And the key thing that I, I want people to understand is uh, by all means, go out and study this stuff, study it for fun, study it so that you get a rudimentary understanding of it, um, study it so that you become an actual scientist involved in the field if that's what you're interested in. You can learn, to, learn about radiometric isotopes and radioactive decay, uh, you can learn about um, the various layers of rock and how we go about testing and which tests are good for which one and what the exact map of all the overlapping methods are. But at the end of the day, if somebody's just coming up and saying, oh, well, we found mistakes in carbon dating. Uh, we found things that were, you know, here was this urn that was dated to, you know, 35,000 years. Well, we know it was made, you know, a week ago Thursday. You don't have to panic. You don't have to um, have a grand understanding of this to rebut it. You just have to know that nobody's claiming that there can't be mistakes, mistakes made given particular methods, especially when humans are involved. But how did you find out that that was mistakenly dated? Did you get a revelation from God that, hey, that urn was mistakenly dated? Or was it actual, reliable, scientific dating methods that told you that that urn was given the wrong date? And if that's the case, then you are accepting dating methods. And the only reason that you're pointing out that one of them got it wrong is so that you can conveniently try to claim that it got it wrong on something else. The problem is we actually demonstrated through science that the urn was dated incorrectly. You don't just get to assert that a date is incorrect. You don't just get to claim, ah, because it is imperfect, it is therefore unreliable. Those are two very different things. Each one of us, if you're watching this video, you're, you're able to watch it. There may be video artifacts uh, due to your network connection, which certainly would reduce the perfection of this video. But it doesn't mean that it's unreliable, and it doesn't mean that you didn't get the message. That's the question to ask them. How do we go about figuring out that carbon dating was inaccurate when used in this scenario? And if that method that showed where carbon dating was inaccurate has also showed carbon dating to be accurate, now they've got to challenge that method. And I don't know how far down they can try to dig, but at the end of the day, science is putting together the puzzle of the universe. We have more and more data. We know more about where the pieces fit. We know more and more about how to measure them. Religion has done nothing even remotely approaching that. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.